Hey everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in to today's show where we have two special guests. So we have Don and Clara, uh, so uh, two INFJs uh, here to talk about uh, what it's like to be an INFJ, how they discovered that they were INFJs, and also how it feels to uh, be together with another INFJ and how that uh, interaction feels. So first of all, uh, thank you both for joining in. Uh, how are you doing today? Thank you. Um... And uh, I'm good. Uh, got some wine here. And it's been like a nice spring weather here in Sweden. Uh, but we also had a snowstorm this uh, today. So I guess it's just a balance of things. Sounds Are like you talking spring. about the weather? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the worst. You know, <laughs> trying to act uh, as if I'm normal. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, I, I want show. to talk about the weather. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I already did, so yeah. it, it's finished. You tried small talk. Yeah. <laughs> I want to just get right into it. And so what I'm curious about is, uh, how did you uh, find out that you were INFJs? And how did it feel the first time when you figured out that you were an INFJ? Maybe Clara can begin. Uh, that's quite a long story. I was... Uh, together had a, a boyfriend and uh, two children and we were on our way to separate uh, and I felt like there was uh, a need in me to talk to others like philosophy and I couldn't do that with him so things were it were lost parts in the relationships and I tried to find them to take responsibility for them in my own way. So I started a group on um, uh, Facebook, that uh, a philosophy group. And when I spoke to them, they uh, told me about uh, um, this personality test. Myers-Briggs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and when they heard my thoughts and yeah, we got to know each other, they told me about INFJ and they said that I was probably INFJ and uh, oh, now I dropped his phone yeah. uh, so they told me about INFJ and uh, I took the test and uh, it showed INFJ and th then they also had these questions because they were like experts on it <laughs> so they were curious uh, and they told me to go to a group on Facebook and uh, I did, and I started to talk to the Dan. <laughs> yeah. So, and what I felt, it was like, it's some, uh, it's, it's some terms that got me, like it opened up a door to me. And that is the word high sensitivity. Yeah. Uh, that opened a door for me and then also a word I don't know the English word for it uh, särbegåvning oh, uh, giftedness yeah giftedness because my child was um, on a control and they told me about uh, yeah they had an explanation to why my child could uh, tell the alphabet when she was very young and yeah she spoke very early and things mm. like that. And that also opened up a door to, uh, to me my, about my childhood. And then this INFG, to be so uh, alien, that thought, yeah. And uh, when I got into that group, I felt like, whoa, they think like me. And uh, this to be a paradox that feeling that people can't put you in a box and they also say that and they feel like people are quite afraid of me I think because of that that they can't uh, figure me out so are you a person that can get in with any group uh, but not really fit in anywhere or exactly yeah <laughs> it's like if I would take my friends and put them in the same room 
let's uh, say it was a wedding, they would not get together. <laughs> I would need to get them drunk if they yeah. are going to exactly. get together. But I can uh, work with them. Like we adapt somehow. Uh, I yeah, I really recognize that because my friends, if I put them in the same room, they would start arguing. Um, because most of the people I know, they got like one or two things in common with me, but they lack everything else. And uh, I, I think when I met Clara, uh, it's like she had all areas in common with me. And that's the first time I've ever mm. felt that. To like speak the same language also. Yeah. It's like we that we that are INFJ, we don't need to, uh, we don't need the words. We feel so much around us and it's other, uh, yeah. it's another language. It's like uh, when we were getting ready for this interview and um, we were like, I was fixing my beard and, and, uh, and I thought, I would like some wine. And then 15 seconds later, she said, it would be nice with some wine. <laughs> and because I saw it in you like the, uh, it the happen, way. It happens all the time. Yeah. And, and we've uh, not been together for more than, not a year uh, now. But you're uh, both very good at reading each other. So. It, yeah. It, it seems like that way. And also yeah. this, that you do, you know, what like I know what he's having in his unconscious uh, and you know what I have in my unconscious because we're, we're feeling each other but we are not feeling ourselves that yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's like I'm I can be like affected by her underlying emotions mm. and she don't doesn't even know she got them and I feel like, hmm, something is on its way. It's like something sneaky is going on here. Yeah. But it, it's like outside her, um, outside of her conscious mind. Um, and I see it before her and she says to me, it's something going on with you. And I'm saying, no, it's not. But then it arrives in into the conscious mind and yes she was right so yeah and be before i i am very analytical but now we're analytical together so everything that we see and go through we, <laughs> we turn it like around 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 the same yeah. sequences yeah, yeah it, would, <laughs> it would annoy the hell out of other people yeah it's like uh, detailed stuff uh, but uh, did you finish your how you found out? Yeah, the, can you hold the phone? Uh, sure, Mike. sure. Uh, I found out about being being an INFJ uh, like 10, 12 years ago, I, I think. And this was during a period of time where I had battled uh, anxiety. And... Um, I was coming back, I had uh, uh, found out that meditation and uh, mindfulness and all that sort of stuff and also that I needed uh, routines and planning of my life. And I was devouring anything in those areas. It's like philosophy, I, I was already into the philosophic stuff, but uh, psychology and uh, personal development also esoteric stuff and uh, then suddenly I found this Myers-Briggs test and I thought why not I like tests so I, I did this test and when I saw the result it actually my tears ran down my face because this was the first time in my life that I had ever been uh, getting this feeling of uh, being understood. 
I had never seen this before. And I thought from early childhood that something was wrong with me. I, I had always had this feeling. And when I saw this and I read about this INFJ, it's like, I'm not, I, I'm not an alien. Yeah. yeah, nothing is wrong with me. I had an um, INFJ friend uh, who didn't want to take the MBTI test uh, because he said that he was afraid of what result he was going to get because he really thought there was something wrong with him. And uh, mm. uh, yeah, like that uh, sounds a bit similar to that kind of what you were saying now a little bit. Oh, yes. Mm. Uh, and I had this, especially since um, I'm a man. And I came from a very little place in the rural area where you were supposed to be using, you know, a hammer, nails, or uh, good with cars. Uh, it was, being a man was not that easy uh, when you didn't fit in at all in that role. Mm. Um, so, which made me feel like a, a big uh, failure. Right, because there are so many things in there, like uh, in the so many INFJs relate to being highly sensitive, and uh, yes. uh, many INFJs uh, relate to being shapeshifters. So a lot of time they kind of take and adjust their personality very much to the people around mm. them, and uh, because of that, I can understand that it can be that you sometimes feel like your personality is a, a bit of a paradox or a bit complicated uh, for people to take in sometimes. But I'm curious. Uh, how uh, did you two, uh, you told a bit already, but how did you meet each other? And how did you notice in each other is that uh, you were dealing with an INFJ? Like, how did you notice that when you were interacting with each other the first times? Um. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest about this because it's like, a, it, it's like a higher dimension. We talked to each other uh, and we didn't need our bodies like we were really facing each other in other ways so when we met it was a half year later and we already knew each other like we said that we loved each other on the first mm. day i think it's 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 not like the typical thing i would do mm. i'm 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 very cautious about other people and meeting and saying the right stuff but um we she joined this group like a bit over a year ago and i i saw from day one when she posted something weird that wow this is what i've been looking for and um, i just thought about it and then she con contacted me and we started to talk and talk and talk and we we talked every day for hours and then we started to speak on the phone uh, and we had this uncanny um, things like things in common that are really weird um, yeah <laughs> they are really weird <laughs> yeah yeah, like weird music. It's very bizarre things. Bizarre things like uh, the funny bunny rabbit uh, thing where, where you put a, a five uh, Swedish crowns in it and you get a toy. And we oh. both had obsessed about this funny bunny thing. <laughs> yeah. Which, which yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> why? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. So we we thought alike, I guess. Uh, we were talking about Nietzsche and Eckhart Tolle uh, from day one, mm -hmm. and, and it was really deep stuff, and it was also spiritual stuff. Uh, like we were sending pictures and music and poems and everything in a big mess mm. but, but during that time a lot of things happened to us personally as well yeah, so it's it's really hard to explain 
yeah, very hard to explain. And uh, your poems, they revealed the future. Like he had written poems uh, before we knew each other and they said things about the present. And uh, hmm. it was much like that. And also memories of, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain. Yeah. And we did things like, it's quite like rituals that we used, we knew to, that we needed to do them. We, we took a, um, a seed and planted it because we wanted to plant an ID. Mm -hmm. And the, it was just like, it was like we were listening to something and just following. It sounds like uh, um, you're able to uh, yeah, meet each other's needs in uh, like a lot of mysterious ways. It sounds like, uh, especially like where you connect, it seems uh, almost uh, spiritual. Uh, yeah. That, uh, um, yeah, that you kind of connect uh, more mentally or intellectually or uh, through philosophy or through uh, these kind of synchronicities that you talk about. Uh, um, are there any uh, areas where you can struggle uh, with having this like state of open communication or like with being able to read each other so well or can that sometimes be difficult as well? Yes, uh, we, we are, we do have some argu arguing going on sometimes and it's usually about these, you know, under the surface kind of emotions. Uh, where we read each other and being very honest, uh, which could trigger uh, the ego mechanisms. Uh, and that's where, where it could be things <laughs> you need to solve. Right. Uh, but we always do that. And it's mm. so far, it's, it's been, uh, it's been, you know, as an INFJ, you're used to read other people while you sit back and no one see you coming. But now you can't hide. And that's, uh, I'm not used to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm getting used to it, but I'm still not there. Uh, it's impossible to hide stuff. Yeah. Very much, and we we talk about like what's happening. Like when you said, "Now I I want to run away," mm -hmm. this fight or flight mood that we speak of what's happening inside of us now. Yes, and and, and she can tell me now you're in your ego, and you know the ego doesn't like to hear that, so it's <laughs> like <clears throat> I'm not. <laughs> but right. And, right. and the same for me that I can say like now I'm my ego speaks and yes uh, not that it, it is wrong to be uh, an ego because we need our ego that is very important it's necessary but it's just when you're trapped inside your ego yeah, and, that's and, the thing and, and your defense mechanisms are, are acting like small children yeah yeah, I like to say that ego is just uh, like what we know about ourselves already, like the, yeah. the things we've figured out and understand and rationalized about ourselves, uh, while the self is much broader than that. So the self yeah. is like everything we can also become and everything we can learn. So the ego is very conservative, so very much yeah. about keeping things, uh, keeping the status quo. I also think the ego is protecting us, yeah. putting limits out there for intruders to mm. run into. Without, without being able to reach inside. Right, right. Because uh, extroverted feeling, uh, that's the one of the stronger functions for the INFJ. Uh, that's, it gives you the ability to read other people, but does it give you the same ability to read yourself? Uh, like, or do you, is that like an area where you help each other out? Yes, that's a big um, benefit, I think, because I can feel she's getting into something and I can tell her and she hasn't noticed yet mm -hmm. and the same thing happens for me mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a big help because um, earlier in, in life 
it's been uh, the same mistakes over and over because I I lose touch with my own feelings and I detach into outer space kind of and someone tells me uh, why don't you open a window or why don't you put the light on and I'm just somewhere else and I don't feel that the, uh, I need uh, fresh air or food or light because I, I, um, I run away from my body. So, and this keeps me grounded. We right. also have a project together that is about how you can feel yourself better. Like we have this um, language says something more. You have this quote or when you say that the world is on your shoulders, yeah. that says something. It's like if you have something that is worrying you, then you put it on your shoulder, then you will have an ache in your shoulder. Right. So is to read your body. Where where do you feel some tension or and that says something. So I think that helps us a lot to really be in touch with our, with our body to know mm. wh what is that and to uh, translate that. Right, because um, it's very common for introverted judging types to have a very strong sense of responsibility and to like want to take on responsibility or to put too much on themselves. So oh, yes. uh, it sounds like you're uh, talking about that struggle of uh, uh, like taking on too much, but not recognizing that you're like overwhelming yourself or that you are mm -hmm. causing yourself stress or unnecessary stress or anxiety by doing so. Yeah, and easy to let go of your self-worth to be there for others. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, as you say, it's like you don't notice it. Right. And also, we got this INFJ elitism, I think, we think that we can carry more than others yeah, <laughs> because we, we got the better uh, methods or we're smarter or we've uh, practiced more and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's what I do. Uh, I, can take, I can take more, I think, but being highly sensitive at the same time, it's, it's kind of a paradox. And then Leon was in the sofa in the evening and... Oh, I can't do anything. I'm so tired. Yeah. <laughs> That's when we feel that we are tired, not while doing it. No. Yeah. yeah, it's a theory of mine that uh, uh, this is the ESTP shadow of the INFJ in a sense that uh, uh, if you have that uh, sensitive, uh, uh, like natural state in a sense that, uh, um, yeah, like there's always something moving in the unconscious. Like every time you make a movement towards uh, uh, like the detachment and uh, towards uh, uh, that state of a uh, yeah, more existential state, it's uh, as if there's also movement inside the self towards like, yeah, like the, because you're detached, like you don't notice your own feelings. You don't notice your own like exactly. difficulties and struggles. And so you think they don't exist. Um, mm. like, oh, I don't have any emotions or I don't have any needs or I don't have anything. So I can do whatever I can do. I, uh, I can be super strong and uh, mm. um, super great as an ESTP in a sense. Um, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. And then you find yourself being worn out or tired and you think, oh no, I think I got this terminal disease or something. But, mm. but then it's just tiredness. It's like being an ant and yet not an ant because an ant follows the queen and we don't follow the queen. <laughs> if the queen has good reasons, then we follow. <laughs> but if the queen doesn't have good reasons, so, so then we uh, start uh, uh, yeah, a, a, new a rebel group of uh, ants. So we are the last... <laughs> Which uh, run renegade ants. Yeah. <laughs> like the child movie ant. Isn't that the name of the movie? Ants. I yeah. think the name ant, is ants. Ant, yeah. It, yeah. I recognize myself in him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. So um, 
I want to talk about uh, INFJ development a little bit uh, and uh, how you have uh, grown to be happier over the years. Hopefully you have <laughs> grown to be happier over the years and to yes. be more true to your needs. So I'm curious, like, what was your childhood like and uh, what kind of INFJ experiences did you have growing up? Do you want to begin? Sure. Um, as a child, I... I grew up in the woods, kind of, and that was my playground. Um, and uh, read a lot of uh, comic magazines and some books, but mostly comic magazines. And I dreamt myself away because I didn't feel like the other children, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to be as much with other children as my um, the people around me uh, but, but I had my parents saying I should call these uh, so, so I did and um, it was kind of a um, I think it was a good thing to grow up in the woods but at, from a quite early age I was bullied in school because I didn't look like everyone else. I was a lot taller and um, which made me look like I was older. Uh, so the, the guys who were like two years older, they, they thought they could behave towards me as they did with their own age. Um, and uh, I wasn't as strong and, you know, I was kind of shy. Yes. So I was bullied from, uh, well, first grade, I, I think, till uh, ninth grade. Uh, the whole, um, I don't know the English name for the school systems, but until I was 16 years old. Um, and that was a big pain, of course. But it also from somewhere I got this idea that these things that uh, troubled me could be used as development. Uh, so I guess Nietzsche would have approved of that. <laughs> uh, and Nietzsche was also one of my saviors from that time. Uh, so I read a lot of Nietzsche and uh, I also liked Stoicism. And I, and I also found out about uh, the metal, death metal and uh, black metal and, and that kind of music, uh, which also, uh, it was a, a great exploration because I found out that within that kind of music, you can be a freak and it's a good thing too. Um, so... So that made me find a, a kind of home. And um, from that day, the bullying, um, that was no more. But instead, I was a troubled young man uh, wondering, why do I live? And that kind of thing. Uh, existential questions and angst about that. And I also had developed some kind of paranoid uh, thing because of the building, I guess. And my self-esteem was very low. I was like eight, 18 to 20 years old at this time. Uh, so I developed anxiety, which was, had been you know, evolving since younger age. But mid-20s, this um, uh, general anxiety disorder, uh, uh, it came to the surface. Uh, and I had problems with that for like five years. And I didn't get any help from uh, he the healthcare system. And no one knew anything about it. And I didn't know anyone who knew anything about it. And all the men around me were silent because where I came from, 
as a man, I had two options um, when I when I had this psychological disorders. I should either drink or work or, you know, end it all. Uh, it's like nothing no one talks about because you don't want to seem weak. Uh, but I thought there must be a way uh, to battle this. So I started to uh, searching the web and then I found out um, about mindfulness and um, cognitive, uh, what's the name of it? Behavioral therapy, CBT? Yes, yes, that's right. Mm. Um, and I, I learned a lot about that. And then because of mindfulness and all that, I started to read about Eckhart Tolle and all those books. And I read a, a lot of uh, personal development literature. And uh, the anxiety was now under control, but I had this new interest then. So I started to write my book about it, which I, uh, it's, it was published in 2016. And from there, I, I've just kept going on with this uh, exploration and uh, refining myself all the time. Uh, so, yeah, today I'm helping other people because a few years ago I got this feeling for the first time in my life. I was now in my 40s uh, that finally I'm, I found this home in myself. When I was younger, I, ha I had this uh, feeling, I think a lot of INFJs do have that I long for a home that I do not know if exists. And there are some different names of, of this feeling. Uh, and I was dreaming about another planet. I don't come from this planet, I come from somewhere else. Uh, and finally, when I you know, refined myself, I got this feeling that I found this home and it's without, it's within my own heart. And that was like a feeling of relief. That's uh, quite a story. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing uh, about that. Uh, so it uh, uh, sounds like uh, you travel a lot existentially and I can really imagine that stoicism, for example, uh, can be like a really powerful way to deal with like something like being bullied or something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I can also see like how uh, somebody like Eckhart Tolle could be helpful for people who struggle with anxiety, uh, mm. especially like if you read The Power of Now uh, and uh, those kind of books, because he really uh, captures uh, and like helps people like find a way to kind of, um, I feel like almost manage and understand where those like feelings can come from, like the feeling of vertigo or if, uh, like the struggling with like, uh, anxiety and like how it can feel like it pulls you in a sense and like the ability to resist that or the ability to yeah. stay strong in yourself. Mm. But how, uh, how would you describe the quite the immature uh, young INFG if you like refer to yourself and the mature INFG? Oh yes. Um... I would say that if you if you compare the me of today with the me who was like 18 years old, I would say that the younger one uh, had this idea about himself being a, a victim and feeling sorry for himself, thinking a lot about no one understands me uh, and I don't like people. Uh, it's hard to be around people. Uh, it was it was a lot about that because it, uh, it's so everyone should pity me because it's so hard for me. I had those tendencies, 
uh, today I don't see it that way. It's it's like today I, I'm being more honest about things I would be ashamed of and try to hide when I was younger. Mm. Uh, but I will, would also like to say that uh, through life, what's happened is that when you are highly sensitive, uh, everything feels like the double, double the pain. Uh, so what happened to me because of the bullying and the anxiety and all that was that I had to grow this hard shell around myself to be able to protect myself. And now in this mature age, I finally find out that I could remove pieces of that armor uh, because I rely so much on myself today that, that I don't need to protect myself anymore. Yeah, because uh, uh, the INFJ flows uh, personality type, as I see it, they, they enter into flow states or they become happier when they are able to, uh, one, of course, you know, get the ex their existential and spiritual and intellectual meet, needs met, which it sounds like you were able to do to some extent throughout life uh, because of your exploration of philosophy and uh, self-reflection and things like that but also by being able to connect with other people uh, through extroverted feeling. Um, it really seems like both of those functions are necessary to uh, create like a good loop for yourself where you're able to uh, feel like you're able to not just think for yourself and f reason about the world or speculate on things, but also to share and make yourself understood to other people. Um, yeah. So it sounds like you're lear learning to do that more and more like in later years. So. It's definitely like life gets a lot easier when you get older. Mm. It's, it was a true pain at young age. But at the same time, when I see like when I'm 40 and the other people in from, from school and you know, they've already settled for a long time ago. Um, while I still feel that I'm not even started, right? kind of, because uh, curiosity never dies. And I feel like finally this, uh, you know, this flesh prison you got there, it's under control. And uh, all the mental stuff that's been disturbing you, that's also under control. And now, the fun begins. <laughs> it's like when we were children, we were like adults. So we didn't work with other children because we were so old. And now when we are aging, we are children and others are adults. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right. <laughs> mm. It's the Yoda-like regression, you know? <laughs> yeah. You become a little <laughs> bit more playful and uh, uh, you find yourself like amused by everything. And uh, yeah, you really go like into, I've also gone into existentialism and absurdism and, and that ability to uh, like uh, look at life that way has been like very uh, positive for me as well. And um yeah just connecting more with the world in a sense because uh, without that philosophical lens uh like it's so easy to get overwhelmed by life by work by relationships by people uh but uh, through that like philosophical lens and when you have like found the right perspective and outlook it really helps so i was curious uh like what about you uh, clara like how was your uh what have you learned uh, growing up and what was your INFJ childhood like? Yeah, um, I am very open with my childhood because I've healed in my childhood and to be open is a part of the healing process. So my childhood was very traumatic and I was sexually abused when I was a kid from maybe people they uh, often ask which age but I don't know because I was in a treatment of my trauma when I were maybe 20 and he took photos and looked at those photos and he found a special um, stare that I had when I was a kid 
it's uh, it's the name is thousand yards stare it's like when soldiers are in war and they are uh, they it's an empty stare so he found a photo and i'm i think i was maybe two years old uh, and i have diaries when i describe my traumas so i think that it ended maybe in um, the class. <laughs> sixth grade. But, yeah, sixth grade. Um, so we were about so, 13. Yeah, so it's a long, a long uh, period of trauma. I also had a narcissistic dad um, and I had a brother that bullied me and I was an outcast in school. Yeah, this old, this kid that was uh, yeah, because I had to be old. I, I had so much trauma. So I was like an adult when I was a kid. Uh, and my mother was also like an adult when she was a kid. So it's also heritage. Uh, so other kids didn't understand me. Um, so my childhood, I would describe it. If I had one word, I would describe it as very confusing because a kid doesn't know what's outside of that box. Uh, I didn't know what I was, um, what they did to me, or if that, like other kids were asking if they could be together. And I didn't know what, what's with that. <laughs> it's like everything that is supposed to be normal for others were very much more confusing for me. Um, but it helped to, to write. So I, I, I had these diaries and other, I wrote books. And I also had a, a book that uh, I was going to publish when I was a kid because the, it was all, all I did was like draw and sing and write and um, to ask questions to myself, it saved me. But at the same time to ask questions, then you feel like you are this uh, annoying kid. The teachers didn't want any kids to ask questions and the kids didn't want uh, other kids to ask questions because if you were a kid in the classroom that asked questions, then everybody were going to be there in the classroom when the classroom, uh, when the clock was ticking to oh, the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the teacher didn't want me to ask questions because I could see through the education like you have no reason to teach this can you give me a reason and they didn't because they didn't think about it so i was too challenging for them mm. and um mm, yeah so that was very traumatic but all this to to write about it to make paintings and and so on it helped me to express myself in other ways and to not feel lonely because I had that. And uh, later I, um, I grew up with this box and trapped inside this box. And I also, I remember that I was running away from school and I climbed trees and I looked like out in the horizon. And I, and I was thinking like, how is it beyond that beyond this and that is with me so much because that this was the box and when you are trapped in a box you don't know what's outside so um like i my that my father was narcissistic that also meant for me that i was later on in life going to meet a narcissistic partner because that was familiar to me. And what's familiar to you is supposed to be safe. So I had to go to therapy to notice this, these patterns and to know myself and also to write about it, always write about it. I had my phone and I wrote notes and to recognize the patterns that also appeared in the relationship. Like, what is repeating itself over and over and over and making me tired. And uh, then I got uh, angry and the anger helped me. And uh, the therapist uh, 
was like very happy, but I was angry <laughs> because every, every time that he asked me, how, what do you feel now? I couldn't answer him. I had no feeling inside of me. Yes. Yeah. Anger also helped me after the bullying. And when I found this uh, extremer music, because finally I, I got this way of uh, getting rid of my emotions. And uh, it was like, uh, you know, in, in the Batman, the Joker, when, the, when they say some men just want to see the world burn. And that was exactly how I felt after the bullying, mm -hmm. because I wanted revenge. Uh, and it was a uh, uh, powerful drive, uh, powerful force until you started to see that this power could be used for something better, something constructive. Yeah, because it sounds like uh, you both had this experience uh, growing up that you uh, detached a lot from the world in a sense and went inwards. Uh, yeah. And in many ways, anger can be that kind of like catalyzing emotion that actually gets you to take action in life and like to kind of get out in a sense and to make things happen so while it can be certainly a, a dangerous emotion this can also be a very positive one if you need to make a change in life or you need to move yeah. forward or change patterns in your life what's what's a bit puzzling uh, with us is that both of us have uh, experienced struggle but we do have in common that we turn it around and use it for a, as a leverage. And make it to something crea crea creativity. Like. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know why that is. Why, why did we do that? Why did we see, like, for me, nine years of pain? Why did I use that for good? I don't know who told me to do that because I hadn't read it in any books. Yeah, it just happened. And the, about uh, this anger, because the anger was a force, and the force helped me to get away from the box and to see, to see what's really outside of the box. Yeah. But then after the anger, you can't carry anger because that becomes bitterness. So I found forgiveness, mm. and I learned that to forgive someone isn't the same as telling them that what you did to me was um, right. It's mm -hmm. the opposite. It's about me that I had to um, take this anger out of my shoulders and move yeah. on in life. So yeah. I, I, for, I forgive like the, um, the men what they did to me as a child. And I also forgive my family because they uh, they didn't choose to stand for me they chose to stand for the mm, what's the name yeah the the ones that uh, you're not to blame you mean it's like yeah but they didn't stand for me they didn't choose me they didn't uh, fight for you or like yeah. stand up for you Exactly, and it's yeah. much psychologic, a lot psychologically behind that because it can be too much to take in. So you take like, and also Stockholm syndrome, and it's it's uh, complex. It's too yeah. heavy. Yeah, exactly. So I forgive everyone in my past, and that makes me uh, mm. that it can help me to move on in life, and also I don't have this shame. Because when I grew up, I had so much shame. And uh, that's not my shame to carry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is other people that what they did to me, it's their shame. And uh, like we, uh, we, when we have some illness, we can't uh, know that the illness will drab, drabba. Uh, affect. Affect us, yeah. And yeah. that is the same with if we have something traumatic. We, sh we should treat it as an illness. Yeah. About forgiveness, uh, I, I uh, think about, you know, the, the forgiveness from the Bible when, the, when uh, Jesus is put on the cross and, and uh, he says the famous words of 
forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Yeah. And that's the true mm -hmm. forgiveness because it's um, people are not aware of what they're doing, I think, in, mm -hmm. in many of the, these cases. And I also think about the words of Nietzsche that you should not become a monster yourself when you're fighting one. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you cut the, the ropes to the abyss, you will not be pulled down by the weight. Yeah, I think of uh, with forgiveness, I think uh, of how uh, people can often find themselves rationalizing bad behavior in other people or to excuse it or explain it. And of course, there's always an explanation, like no matter how bad it is or how twisted it is, there's always an explanation or excuse for everything. Uh, the thing is, we can understand why people do what they do and still think that they did the wrong thing and still uh, uh, feel that we don't want to have that in our life or that still feel that we need to make other choices for ourselves and I think forgiveness is also uh, like you said it's really is that uh, you um, you uh, hope that they learn from it and you focus on moving on for yourself in a sense in the moving on is the most important thing Yeah, I, th I think also that we are in FGs tend to um, not focus on having an opinion because we can take our values and uh, move them aside. We mm. want to look at things with distance and observe what is really happening and describe it to ourselves without feelings. Like, mm. So we can see it clear. I can, I can see also this, that there could be confusion in this forgiveness that we somehow, we allow too much to happen to us because we don't uh, put the limits out there mm. and uh, we also see too much sometimes the good in others that we close our eyes to the things that can hurt us too mm. and that's a lesson I've learned uh, through life and that also makes me think nowadays I won't take any shit from anyone and I also make that very clear at work and in private. Uh, if I see someone trying to use me in any way, I will stop it. But it's been a hard lesson to learn. And I still can do the same mistakes in that department. Boundaries you have to keep setting every single day over and over again, I know this. Oh, yeah. That's an annoying thing about him. Uh, I, can really understand uh first thank you again for sharing your story as well clara uh that uh, when you've had like difficult experiences like that that it can be really nice to have found an infj uh partner mm -hmm. like somebody that can uh, relate and somebody that uh, can provide like stability and like a space like that so it must be really great yeah very very much <laughs> yeah and we we are transparent with our triggers so mm -hmm. i got this feeling that if someone is hiding something from me i get really you know ready to strike and uh, she got some other triggers mm -hmm. and this is because of our past life what yeah. what uh, from uh, you know past mm -hmm. relationships and that kind of thing mm -hmm. I wanted to move a little bit in a positive note. Uh, as, uh, so I had one like final question for you both, and that's in regards to, you both mentioned that you have done a lot of writing in your life and that you both have uh, been drawn to uh, creative pursuits. Uh, are you also uh, exploring creative uh, things together, like writing together or? Yes. Um, I, I know you have a podcast together. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so far, uh, you know, we got this uh, uh, everyday uh, silliness, creativity. Uh, actually, this evening we had this shadow theater thing with a, a flashlight from her uh, phone and making, you know, figures at the wall uh, cool. with her children. So that type of creativity, we use it every day. And we, we act as if we are like other people and uh, funny, yeah. using funny voices, 
and making scenes be, around, you know, normal people just to make them feel awkward. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that type of, of creativity. But we also got the podcast and we're working on a book. And we also do music together because she, she's a singer uh, and I'm a guitarist who also can do some other instruments, which means we can do a lot of playing together. And we, we come from, uh, at, at least it was that way when we met, that we had uh, different um, ways of doing things. Uh, you know, I, I've been obsessed about structuring things, making it efficient. Uh, so I was kind of almost robotic in a way. And she had a more playful approach. And that's something I really needed to be reminded of because I tend to overdo things. If I'm playful, I'm only playful. I, I don't get stuff done uh, in the end. And if I go all into the productivity thing, well, I will miss out on life, <laughs> you know, the fun things. Right. Just lying in the grass, looking at the clouds, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, we help each other there. Yeah. And I had, uh, um, I was signed with a la label before, but I uh, couldn't handle it because they, the music business now is very much about that it will sound, the sound will be uh, the good. Like you will sing a lyrics that is not about what you sing, but that is it, the sound will be good for people to just yeah, so it's just uh, an instrument yeah exactly and the, i was only a voice like i i was not able to have my personality right right so i couldn't um uh, yeah i couldn't handle it and now i feel like it's very much freedom to have this instead that he he plays guitar and i can sing and i can write and mm. we can have fun because i believe in art for art's own sake like yeah it's not just about the art's sake it's also for your own sake because you feel good when you do it mm. because you need it it's like what you talked about before you you spoke of life uh, in a sense that it made me think about children when they they don't have need a reason to laugh like if you have a reason then you can take that reason away from someone uh, it was something that you said that made me think about that uh, maybe absurdism yeah. or uh, mm -hmm. things like that to connect yeah. yeah and this is the same with creativity that you just have to create hmm. Yeah, uh, my YouTube channel has been very much focused on uh, the flow state and helping people find that state of flow or a zen or like uh, when you're completely in the zone. And for me, that is like when you really release all the shoulds and musts and expectations and reasons and uh, you just live for your own sake because everyone has their own unique interests and values and way of being and approaching life. But we live very much in a society that everyone has to be the same and act the same and so that means most people are not really in flow or are not really able to laugh or like let go or uh, let loose like you mentioned uh, when we talked a bit earlier in the video about uh, for example how people might need alcohol to drink in Sweden in order to be able to really open up or have fun in a sense so that's uh, yeah my that's been my passion to help people find that ability to really express who they really are and to really find who they really are and it's the same it's what you're talking about now is that everybody needs to be creative in some way mm -hmm. and we also lock inside the creativity it's like you have to be an artist to paint right we, we make this false discourses like uh, boxes 
and trap inside people that can associate to being that. And the other people that don't have that interest, they don't found out how they are creative. And that's a problem. Yeah, we honor, we, we pride ourselves on creativity, but only the end result, never the process to getting there, which can be very messy and full of mess, mistakes and uh, play and uh, mm. what sounds like a waste of time at the time, but it turns out to be something really fascinating. Yeah. And there's so many ways that we can be creative. It's like that I could imagine uh, a world outside of my box that is also to be creative. Like, how we think and mm. it's not just dance and sing or paint it's more than that yeah yeah it's the freedom around it uh. so i want to say uh thank you again both uh, for joining in in this discussion and uh for sharing your infj experiences and uh yeah, um, I will link the podcast down below. It is in Swedish. Uh, but for all the Swedish speakers who happen to be tuning in, I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, I've seen that you've talked about some really fascinating topics. So I'm really also looking forward to check that out myself later. Thanks. Thank uh, you. It's been a nice and interesting interview. How's the weather now? Uh, I think it's really dark <laughs> and I see some uh, liquid uh, pink elephants floating around. That's so yeah. that it's yeah. a good weather. I Quite think. normal. Yeah. But isn't that the best uh, with Sweden as well when it gets this dark? You can just go out and you can just like stare at the darkness and just, I don't know, just enjoy that as well. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Anyways, thanks again and have a great evening. And. Thank, Thank you. you. You too.